Uh, next up is dynamic lighting. So first of all, we can set up some basic dynamic lighting again. Also, one note is you can actually convert lights. So if you place a standard light and you right click it and you do convert lights, you can convert them to different types. I did this once in the past and then it corrupted my level though. It actually completely corrupted it to an extent that you couldn't open it anymore. And it was related to the light. So since then I refrained from doing that. But presumably that has been fixed nowadays and it might work. Either way, to place a dynamic light, you can go back to the actor classes, lights. There's different types of them, but let's just start with a point light. And there you have a movable point light, toggleable one, or a dominant one. These three, all three are dynamic. So let's just start with a movable one for a moment. A movable one or a toggleable one, they're pretty much the same. Technically, a toggleable one you can turn on and off, and a movable one you can move. But uh, I believe you can also move a toggleable one, and you can definitely also turn on and off a movable one. So, there we go. I have a movable one now. You can see it has a different icon. It has this, uh, these moving lines next to it or whatever. And you can move this around. So first of all, you get two, you have two different ways of having of getting dynamic shadows. So this is now a dynamic light, but it costs no shadows, as you can see. Rebuilding won't make a difference. This doesn't cost shadows. Uh, the first way of getting dynamic shadows to appear is by enabling them on a normal movable light. So this is a normal movable light. It's not a dominant light. That's something we'll get back to in a bit. It's a normal movable light. And if you then go into the properties and you set light shadow mode from modulate to normal, then you get shadows. Even if you deselect it, see? So that's one way of getting dynamic shadows. This is fairly expensive, something we'll get back to later on as well, but you could definitely don't want to overdo this. And this gives you 100% sharp, real dynamic shadows. Fully dynamic, if you move the light, nothing is pre-calculated. It's all dynamic. A second way of doing this is by using dominant lights. So you can see you have a dominant point light. You also have a dominant directional light. And a movable version of that. And um, you also have dominant spotlight. I'm going to add a dominant point light here. Uh, a dominant light is in between a dynamic light and a static light. So a dominant light is a bit of both. It casts both a static shadow and a dynamic shadow. And it's both static and dynamic. It has to be pre-calculated, but at the same time it's also a dynamic light in the in-game. So it's really in between the two. And one of the things that this does is that it casts distance field shadows. And again, distance field shadow is a bit of a mix between a static shadow and a dynamic shadow. I can demonstrate that here. If I add a dominant light, and the thing with the dominant light is you can only have one of them in a scene. So you can only have a single dominant light in the level. So once you've added one of them, you can't add another one. And since the majority of the time the directional light, the sunlight, is dominant, that already excludes everything else. You can't add a point light anymore or whatever. There's technical reasons for that, due to the, sh the shadow it renders. And... Um, you can see you have a shadow here, so if I now rebuild this, then you can see the distance field shadow in action. And you can see after rebuild, the shadow is somewhere in between uh, a blurry light map and a well-defined dynamic shadow. It's quite in between. I can show you very quickly in an empty level as well. You can very clearly see the difference between the two. So here we have a simple level, just a cube, where you have one static normal standard light, which is currently disabled, and we have a, a dominant point light. You can see the dominant point light casts a very well-defined shadow, which is sharper than if you would use a normal light, because uh, I can switch the two around, I can disable this one, and enable the normal light, and then rebuild.
and you can see that makes a clear difference shadow is much worse there's also a lot more compression going on over here uh the dominant light doesn't have that it's much more defined but it's still a bit blocky see this is a real dynamic shadow because i haven't rebuilt rebuilt yet so this is co totally straight dominant uh distance field shadows aren't that straight but they're kind of blending the low res pixels and they kind of draw a line over it a sharp dynamic shadow line on top of it like that see so if i lower the resolution of the mesh here to 32 it will still have an impact on lighting quality but much less so than with a standard light so it's really a mix of both a static light and a dynamic light it's rendering faster than a normal dynamic than a real dynamic light but it's slower than standard lights and you can only have one of them in a level this is what we will use in the real level for the sky this is what what we usually use in 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 outdoor levels for the sky because it gives very nicely well defined uh, shadows from the sun it's nice to work with um so the thing with uh, dynamic lighting is that it's quite taxing the first of all there's two different ways of rendering dynamic lighting in games you have the first shading the first lighting and you have forward rendering and a lot of engines i believe the crisis engine for example and um, I think Unity as well is the third lighting. Unreal Engine 4, for example, is the third lighting. But Unreal Engine 3, UDK, is not the third. It's completely forward rendering based. And the difference between the two is that in a forward rendering based engine, and we'll add the dynamic light again. In a forward based rendering based engine, the lightning is rendered along with the meshes. So as the renderer goes through the scene and it renders the scene, it renders it in pieces. So it doesn't render it block per block or pixel per pixel or whatever, or triangle per triangle. It renders it object per object. So it would first render that object. Then it would say, I'm done, give me the next object. It would get this object, render this, render that, render this, render that. So it renders it per piece. And with a forward rendering based engine like this, it has to render the pieces and the lighting on top of the pieces at the same time. So if you have a lot of different separate pieces, it has a lot of work because it has to go through a lot of small steps. So having a lot of separate meshes is quite heavy as I also go deeper into in the asset development videos. And in the exact same way, if you have a lot of dynamic lights, it's also heavier because then he has to go through a lot of small steps of rendering piece per piece per piece. Because the thing is that every object hit by a dynamic light has to be rendered again. So this mesh, it doesn't have to be, it has to be rendered twice. It has to be rendered once just for itself, just to render itself. And then it has to be rendered again to render the lighting information from this dynamic light on top of it. So every light hit by dynamic light has to be rend every mesh hit by dynamic light has to be rendered twice. If you got two dynamic lights, then this mesh has to be rendered three times. If you got four of them, this mesh has to be rendered four times. So for every light in the scene, every dynamic light it is, every dynamic light in the scene, it has to re-render the meshes hit. And that's that's unique to a, a forward rendering based system. If you go to a deferred rendering, you don't have that problem anymore. In the first rendering, it renders the scene, so it renders mesh per mesh per mesh as usual, but then it renders all the dynamic lights at the end of the cycle all at once. It defers the lightning until the end. I mean, that's a very, it's not a very accurate description. I'm sure programmers would shoot me for this, but in artist language and design language, this is kind of the basic point of how it renders it. The two different systems have very clear pros and cons. Well, the thing is, with, with the third rendering, you can, of course, have as many dynamic lights as you want, because all of the lights are rendered at once at the end of the cycle. So it doesn't matter if you have one light or a hundred dynamic lights, it would render all of that lighting at once anyway. So a deferred rendering-based uh, engine has a much easier time rendering a lot of dynamic lights. Skyrim, for example, is deferred rendering. You would never be able to do Skyrim in Unreal Engine 3. So you would never be able to do a proper day and night cycle and have a lot of guards walking around with torches and all those things you have in, in Skyrim. You would never be able to do those kind of things in Unreal 
because the engine is not made to do that. On the other hand, the shadows are always expensive. So even in a deferred rendering, deferred uh, engine, even the shadows are still expensive. So it's not just the light, it's two parts of it. It's both the light is heavy and the shadows of those lights are heavy. So these lights have no shadows right now. I can enable shadows on them. Set it to non, uh, normal. Now it's even worse because every shadow has to be rendered as well. Every mesh hit by a shadow has to be rendered again as well. So these shadows cause the scene to be rendered even more times. So it got even worse. And even in a deferred engine, for example, Unreal Engine 4 and the Crisis Engine and all, the, all of the other ones, for example, if you look at Skyrim, and if you look at the mod tools for Skyrim, you would notice that a lot of those lights in there, they cast no shadows. And that is because they don't light map their, li their lights. There's no light maps in Skyrim. They, have, they only have deferred lightning. They only have deferred dynamic lightning. And in an engine like that, the shadows are still very much so expensive. So they can't enable shadows on all of their lights. They can only enable it on a couple of the most powerful, strongest and most important lights. Whether or not something is deferred rendered or forward rendered, in, in both cases the shadows are still very expensive. So it's both about the shadows and the dynamic light itself. Both about the light you see and the shadows it cast. So where it, whereas in a forward rendering the light itself is very expensive and the shadow is expensive, in a deferred, re deferred rendering engine the light itself is cheap but the shadow is still very much so expensive. There's also things you would never be able to do in a forward, base, forward rendering based engine. For example what you do in Skyrim, you would never be able to do that over here. You would never be able to do what GTA, for example GTA 4 or something does. You would never be able to do that in Unreal either. So for example in Skyrim where you have a fully dynamic day and night cycle. And where you have at the same time uh, guards running around with torches for example. Those kind of things you wouldn't be able to do in Unreal. Because Unreal wouldn't be able to take care of that many dynamic lights at the same time. It's not designed to render that efficiently. On the other hand, um, if you look for example at Skyrim at the mod tools, and if you actually pay attention to a lot of the lights in Skyrim, they don't have a lot of shadows. A lot of those lights lack shadows because they weren't able to, to enable dynamic shadows on all of their lights because that's still very much so expensive. So dynamic shadows are always expensive, be it a forward base forward rendering base engine or a deferred rendering engine. They're always expensive. Uh, you can still only have a couple of lights in, in an area casting dynamic shadows at the same time. More than two, three, four uh, dynamic shadows in the same area is heavy and it still is in 2013. Um, there's a light mode built into Unreal for this. You can see here you have light complexity. This shows you how many dynamic lights are hitting the meshes. You can see if I have none of these, if I have no dynamic lights, it's black. Black means no, not hit by any dynamic lights. There's a green mesh here, which is the door. So this is the door. The door is dynamically lit because it's, a, it's an interactive mesh. It's a dynamic mesh. So this is green means it's hit by one dynamic lights. Doors and any interactive dynamic meshes are always hit by at least one dynamic light. Something we'll get back to later on. Either way, the rest of the level is black. The moment you add one dynamic light, so I've added one light back, everything that, it, that that light touches goes green. You can see if you change the radius. See, as the radius shrinks, you can see the level goes black again. So pretty much every object hit by this, every object that's green, is rendered twice. Once to render itself, and a second time to render this dynamic light on top of it. If you have two of these lights, you can see it gets dark green. If you got three, it gets orange. If you have four, it gets red. And if you have five, it gets very much so red. So this light complexity view shows you how many, how many dynamic lights are hitting some of the meshes. 
So if these are a bit spread out, for example, like that. And then you can see, okay, well, this part is fine. Like dark green, that's doable. But on this side, it's red. We have to do something here. We have to optimize this better. It's too many dynamic lights. How many dynamic lights you can have in a certain area kind of depends on the level, kind of depends on the target platform, all of that. I mean, if you have a very low poly level, then I'm sure you can have 10, 50 dynamic light, 15 dynamic lights in there. It's not a problem. It depends really on how, ma how much detail there is in the environment. Um, because as I said, every time a mesh hits, a, a light hits a mesh, that mesh is rendered again. So it really depends how many meshes you have in that environment. Is it a very low poly environment or do you have hundreds of little objects in there? So the impact kind of depends on, on the situation. But in general, you want to avoid having stuff go red. I'll delete a few of these. So what I tend to do when I have uh, a dynamic light is I manually include and exclude things using the lighting channels. Because as you can see here, for example, this mesh here, this is a very good example, this is green. So this thing is hit by the dynamic light, it says. Otherwise it wouldn't be green. But as you can see, it's not even inside the radius. And you can absolutely not see it, it's pitch black. So that mesh might be lit by 0.0001% brightness of that dynamic light, but it still forces it to render twice. That's not very good. And that's why I tend to use lighting channels to manually include and exclude meshes from a light. So we don't run into these kind of things. Also, for example, the pillar here is the same, same thing. It's out of range. It shouldn't even be rendering. The side of the staircase here is the same thing. I think it's green as well. See, it's also green. This thing here as well. So there's a lot of meshes here that shouldn't actually be rendering right now. So what I usually do is I take the light. I set it to one of the unused channels, say unnamed 5. I take away static and BSP. You can probably leave the other two because they are dynamic anyway. And then I manually select the meshes it should affect. And enable unnamed 5 on those. And I would do that for everything nearby. That's what I normally do to really optimize how it works. You can see an example of that here in the DM industry, a recoil level. So it's a nighttime industrial level. And there's a couple of um, barrels with fire around. A couple of different places, another one there. They have an animation assigned with uh, a light function, something we will do later on. It's a very basic flickering animation, just like that. When you assign a light function to a light, it automatically becomes dynamic, even if that light doesn't move. So this is dynamic light. You can see here, that one. And uh, in order to optimize this, I also configured the lighting channels. You can see it's set to unnamed 6. And the light panels are also set to unnamed 6. Same for the barrel, etc. So you manually include that what should be included in the lights. Another way of optimizing dynamic lights is by keeping the radius down. So don't make the radius larger than it should, because then it will only affect more meshes. You don't want to affect too many meshes because it would, it would cause them to render again. So try to keep the radius down for as good as you can. And I usually also change the fall of exponent to 1.5 or 1.25. So it fades out more abrupt. Because that will also allow me to get a smaller radius in. You can see if the fallout would be very, the fall off would be a high number. You need a larger radius to get the same look. See, now I need 1,536 uh, 1, to make it look like this. Whereas with 1.25 and 768, I can get about the same look, but a smaller radius. So it's affecting fewer lights. That's another thing I tend to do with dynamic lights to keep them performable. And then lastly, I also tend to trigger them on and off, depending on when I need them. So if I have a dynamic light, 
I don't tend to have it run the entire level long. Uh, I tend to only turn it on when I'm nearby. For example, here we have a mechanical. And uh, in the corridor here, there's a couple of toggleable lights. There's a toggleable light here that, uh, that's turned on. For when you arrive here, an alarm goes off and a scanner comes out of this pipe, which toggles on that light. Then you go through the room here. And then there's a, a little cinematic-like scene here where this robot, robot operates the screens. And then the screens, the televisions go, go on. And uh, several toggleable lights get turned on. That one, for example, and there's another one here. And there's a third one somewhere. I forgot where the third one is, but there's a third one somewhere around here. So those are all dynamic lights. And once those are turned on, however, I don't want them to keep running all the time. I want those lights to toggle off when I'm not in this area anymore. So for example, when I go here as a player, I don't want the lights on the left in the previous room to be still be rendering, because they will still be giving a performance overhead while I don't even see the lights. So what I tend to do in those cases is make a trigger. I think it's this one. So this is a trigger volume. And pretty much every time you leave this trigger volume, it turns off all the dynamic lights in this area. And when you enter the volume, it turns them back on. So basically when you go through the area, everything looks normal. But when you fly away and you're here, everything is actually turned off in the previous room. So that's also something that I think is very, very helpful. Try to have a trigger or a distance check. And if you're further away than this many units, make sure you toggle off the dynamic lights to save performance. You can see here, um, I right click the light and find this in Kismet. Here we have Kismet. It's a bit messy here because of course it's all the game logic in here. But this is the trigger. You can see that is that box. And when you touch the trigger, it turns on this light and these three lights. And when you untouch this trigger, it turns them off. So basically, when you're not in the area, the lights are off. If you're in the area, they're on. This is something I would definitely consider doing if you can in your games and levels. So for example, if you have two rooms, and there's a dynamic light in the second room, and that second room is locked, it's behind a door. Turn off the dynamic light in that second room as long as the door is locked. Only turn on the dynamic light in that second room the moment the door unlocks. And when you're far, far enough and away, turn it back off again. Then interp actors and um, K actors, and as well skeletal meshes, vehicles, weapons, anything that's dynamic, any dynamic mesh, so the players, vehicles, doors, elevators, anything that's uh, not a static mesh actor, they don't use static lighting, they use a light environment. And that's why we have, for example, on the door. That's why the door is green, because the door isn't statically lit, it's using a light environment. I opened the level uh, dynamic lighting for a moment and we're going to use this as a simple test case. So a light environment is basically the average of all the nearby lights. And I can set up an example of that here. I deleted uh, dynamic lights. I'm adding a normal light nearby. Increase the range a bit. And um, I duplicate it. I'm going to work with a cube in the middle here. So I'm going to place four lights surrounding it or let's say uh, three lights to begin with i'm going to give them different colors so it's obvious what's going on so we have a red one here and uh, say a green one on this side and i'll leave the third one just white for a moment so what a light environment is it will take the average color the average position and the average brightness of all nearby lights and it does that because otherwise it would be too heavy for the engine to render the lightning on a dynamic mesh. So if I convert this static mesh here to an interpact, for example, like so, you can see the lighting changed. Now it's switched to a light environment. If you go in light complexity mode here, well, we should rebuild very quickly, otherwise it stays, uh, the color is wrong. You see, after rebuild, the ground is black, which is correct because these are static lights. So the ground does not receive any dynamic lighting at all. However, the cube is green 
Pick, meaning it's hit by a single dynamic light even even while there are three lights nearby so it takes the average brightness and color position of those three and it turns that into one non-existing dynamic light that's that's actually litting that uh, dynamic mesh that's the light environment if it wouldn't do that it would have to hit it would have to illuminate this mesh with three different lights and that's heavy because then it has to render it three times etc that's the problem we talked about earlier so a light environment is an optimization method of always getting a dynamic mesh hit by only a single dynamic light, pretty much. No matter how many lights are nearby that mesh, the mesh will always be only rendered one, one time extra for that light environment. When a mesh has a light environment enabled on it, it also automatically casts a dynamic shadow. So even while these are dynamic, uh, static lights, sorry, and static lights do not cast dynamic shadows. You can see it's off here. They only cast normal static shadows. This is still a dynamic shadow. If you move the cube, the shadow properly updates. That is because a lot the light environment also handles the shadow. And again, that shadow is controlled by the average brightness and position. So it will take the most powerful out of these lights or the, the, the most powerful direction. And that's the direction the shadow will come from. You can see if I now have the red light, which is on this side of the shadow, and I were to increase the brightness, you can see the shadow goes that, that way. However, if I now increase the brightness of this to 8, the shadow again goes that way. So it takes the average position, brightness, and color, and it bases everything on that. Um, there's also a property here in the lights that says uh, cast composite shadow. That is that shadow. This is a composite shadow. So if I take the green light here, which is currently doing most of the shadowing work, and you turn off cast composite shadow, you can see now it falls back on the second most powerful light in the scene, which is red. If I also take red off, now it takes that light, and if I take that off, it will take a default angle coming from directly above the mesh. Uh, I sometimes turn this uh, property off on weak lights. So there are times that, for example, if you have a barrel with fire, I only turn this on on the actual fire light because that's the most powerful one. And I turn it off on nearby ambient lights because an ambient light shouldn't be casting a, a composite shadow. But that's not the biggest thing. You usually don't even notice it if you don't do it. Uh, you can pretty much leave this enabled on almost all your lights and Unreal will do it pretty much correctly all 90% of the time. So it's not the biggest thing to change. Either way, there's problems with this though. Let's make the mesh rather high. Or even more. I'm looking for a very tall vertical mesh. Let's move this light up. And place it near the top. And place the green light near the bottom. Actually, I'm going to delete the white light. I don't really need that. And now you can see the problem. Because it takes the average color and brightness, it's pretty much going to cover the entire mesh with the same color. Another common problem you will have is that when a mesh goes down and it moves through the lighting, it might instantly change color, like so. Which is of course not that nice. And often it will also go completely black. It's not gonna happen now, I think, in this level. But uh, there are times that when the pivot point, the center goes into other geometry or the majority of the mesh is now beneath uh, or inside another piece of geometry, the entire mesh will instantly go black. Again, not very nice. Or you can also, for example, if you have a, a bridge, I made a very simple bridge here. So imagine this is a rather large bridge. Talking a bridge uh, meant for cars or something. Imagine you would have some street lights on that bridge. So there's a couple of uh, small street light standing there, they cast uh, a light, then you are not going to see that light on your mesh, because you can see what happens here, if you would try to place a small powerful light, so let's say this is the light cast by a street light, in one local area of that bridge, you wouldn't see the lighting at all. And if you're unlucky, suddenly the entire bridge will go bright. Again, not very good. There's two solutions to that, but before we go there, let's take a look at some of the properties of a light environment. 
So if you look at the properties of the interpactor, k actor, or whatever dynamic mesh you, you're having, uh, dynamic as m actor, light environment, and here you can see the light environment is enabled. That's default correct. And you have a couple of properties here. For example, dynamic is an important one. If dynamic is off, then the light environment will only be calculated once at the beginning of the game, and it will not update continuously. That's an optimization. I usually turn this off on uh, platforms that really need, their, need all the performance they can get. So for example, iOS. So on iOS, I would turn this off on the majority of meshes. It saves a small amount of CPU, but it's still uh, useful. On PC, the impact is gonna be less obvious. So on PC, I tend to just forget about it. But if you wanna be technically correct, you should turn this off on anything that doesn't move a lot. So for example, a door doesn't move too much. If it's a small door at least, we're talking about the door of a house for example, you're unlikely going to see that, that the lighting doesn't update. So you might as well just turn off dynamic. Cast shadow of course, that obviously cost, uh, turns off the shadow. There's also a boolean light environment. So use boolean and environment shading. It's quite a nice one. I prepared this little setup here with one large cube uh, acting as a, a roof. And then I also placed uh, a dominant directional light. And I have uh, this mesh again over here, which is rotated in the other direction. I have to quickly rebuild this. So you will, what you will be able to see is that uh, a Boolean, use Boolean environment shading, that improves the rendering quality a bit. So with, by default, Boolean is on. And you can see what happens if it's on. So you have a sunlight coming from above. You have the roof casting shadow. But that shadow doesn't appear on our mesh, as you can see. There should have been a shadow here at the end of it, because the last part is beneath the roof. Turning off use Boolean environment shading will fix that. So now we have a proper shadow on our mesh. So I usually turn this off, especially for PC. I pretty much turn it off on almost everything, especially things that are out, outdoors and that might have shadow casted on them from trees or rocks or something like that. And then I turn it off. I believe an indoor environment doesn't matter that much, but in outdoors it definitely helps. You can see when I move, it, uh, it's much better than like this. So that's the light environment. A second way of lighting dynamic meshes is by light mapping them. You can light map a dynamic mesh, a K actor and an interp actor. You can't light map a skeletal mesh, but uh, in case of an interp actor like this mesh, you can go to static mesh components, lighting, and here we will say use pre-computed shadows. If you enable that, you basically turn on light mapping. So I enable that that automatically turns off the light environment. As you can see, now it's automatically disabled because I enabled this one. And then we should also set, make sure the lighting channels are correct. So right now it's still on dynamic. So it's still the, the lighting channel that the light environment was using. We have to change that to static, like most static meshes. Like so. Uh, it's black right now, but if you were to rebuild this, it will light map the interpactor. And then you have this. You see it's a bit stretched out because I stretched out the cube quite a lot. But uh, this does give the most precise lighting at the lowest cost. So this is far faster to render for the engine than a light environment and far faster than the third method that we will do in a minute. So this is the most efficient to render. It gives in a way the, the most detailed lighting. But of course if this mesh were to move this lightning wouldn't update. So the green yellow spot here at the bottom would remain on the mesh even if the mesh moves away from the light. It's not dynamic, it's actually baked into the mesh. So this is the fastest thing to do, but it doesn't update. This is what we do for uh, iOS. You can see here in, in a mechanical, all the interpactors have been light mapped. So the doors, for example, here, these are light mapped. In the properties here, it's uh, use pre-computed shadows is on as well as uh, the static lighting channel. You can see if you switch to lighting only, you can see the compression of the light map on the meshes. 
whereas uh, a light environment would be smooth. This is a skeletal mesh here, this is smooth. So all of our doors, everything that's pretty much an interpactor has been light mapped here because we really needed to have every bit of performance that we could get. Even the K-actors, here is a K-actor, it's a special class but it's a K-actor, even that one has been light mapped. Because the K-actors are rather uniformly lit anyway, so we just baked that lighting onto them. Even the wheels here, some cock wheels, they are light mapped as well. The, the pipe hatch here, these things on top, all of it is pretty much light mapped. You can also see here in the, in the ball, in the portal level, this is a wall made of interpactors. So there's quite a lot of interpactors in this room. All of these panels, several things behind these panels, part of the machinery. On the other side as well, there's more panels, etc. So there's a lot of interpactors around. And when you have a wall that's uniformly lit like this, it's all the same color. And same brightness, same color. It's best to light map that to save some performance. Another case where you want to light map uh, dynamic meshes is when you want it to blend in perfectly. So here at the end of the ball level, we have a tall room. And uh, when you enter the room, the panels start to drop away. Okay. There's a cave behind it. So some of the panels, these, they fell, fall down and uh, the room starts to break down pretty much. When you enter the room, you're not supposed to see which panels it are, because otherwise that would give away that something is about to break. The room is supposed to look seamless and intact, and then the panels are supposed to drop away. So in order to get it to look absolutely seamless, we had to light map the K-actors. These are K-actors. Okay, here's a K-actor, and it's been light mapped. So also if you want, want things to look entirely seamless, you also want to light map it. It's light mapped. Then the third way of lighting dynamic meshes is by turning off the light environments, like we did for the, the baked lighting, but then going full dynamic. So basically you turn off the optimization that the light environment is. If I take this other mesh here, which still has light environment enabled. If you now stick the green light here, duplicate that. You can see it doesn't show up, which is a problem with light environments. If I now turn off that light environment, and I enable the dynamic lighting channel on the light, you now have 100% accurate dynamic lighting on or interpactor. I'm going to turn the dynamic lighting channel also, also on, on the red light here. And then you have this. So now it's 100% accurate. As you can see, it's not optimized. It's not an average color, average brightness, etc. It's not light mapped either. If the mesh moves, then the lighting also updates. But this is heavier. There is a limitation to this, however, that if you have too many lights, they will no longer show up. You can see when I duplicate this slide again, it no longer appears. And that's because there is a built-in protection system that prevents multiple static lights from, too many static lights basically, from uh, lighting up meshes without a light environment. So it allows for two static lights with a dynamic channel enabled, but not for three. So the third one is being ignored. Which is rather annoying. Also, you have to use a uh, dynamic lighting channel. If you were to use, say, uh, Cinematic 7, which is unused, which I also have enabled on the mesh, as you can see. So if you were to pick another lighting channel, it would appear in the editor, but the moment you would play this, that light would not appear. Okay, so in-game, that third light still doesn't appear. So it's limited to two static lights. If you do need more lights than two, more than two, you need to use a dynamic light. So a point light movable, for example. That one will show up. So this one will now show up in the game. You probably don't want this to light up the rest of the environment because it will give quite a uh, performance impact on, that, on the rest of the environment. So what I tend to do is 
turn off all the lighting channels except the one it has to use. Like so. So it doesn't have an impact on the rest of the environment, given it's quite heavy. And then I would use a standard static light next to it, with the same color, the same brightness, same position, that doesn't affect the interpactor. So basically I would have one light to light up the environment, and one light to light up the interpactor beneath it. That would be my approach. And you can see this one does show up, all of them. So if you want the highest quality dynamic lighting, this is the way to go. Turn off the light environment on the mesh you want uh, the accurate lighting on. Possibly enable one of the other lighting channels. And then enable either the dyna dynamic channel on one of the nearby lights, or place movable point lights with a channel of choice. This is rather heavy, of course. If you were to look in a light complexity view, you can see this is now red. And if I duplicate that light again, it gets even redder. So it is relatively heavy, but uh, there are cases where you really do want to do this. For example, the very large bridge example we've used earlier, that would be a case where you, wanna, where you do want to invest this performance to get the best possible quality out of it.